Well, there it is. My beloved California absolutely blanketed by smoke. Somehow both apocalyptic and beautiful at the same time. Some would say it's not the best idea to head right into this. Least of all during a freaking pandemic. But here I am with my mask collection, double pumps of hand sanitizer, and my RV bubble that contains these two fine companions. Like me, they have been tested, layered with protocols, and chosen to interact with the world. Our mission is to head out on Route 395. It's a road that runs down California's eastern spine and that offers up unfair amounts of spectacular sights. The kinds of things that still produce wonder amid a smoky haze. I mean, come on. Along the way, we'll be visiting some of the tech world's outliers, people that like to live and work on the frontier. They're folks trying to feed the planet, fix it, or if need be, just get off it. If thinking different is your thing, then here we go. Show us the way, rented RV with your included dashboard ornament. Show us the way. If you're going to drive an RV through a fiery hellscape during a pandemic, you want to be sure and do it right alongside a massive active fault system. In this case, may I present the Walker Lane, which is often found hugging Route 395. While not as well known as, say, the San Andreas Fault, it's the Walker Lane that gives 395 much of its charm. We're talking hot springs, extinct volcanoes, and mountains. And we're talking more apocalypse, because it's now thought that the Walker Lane may result in Reno ending up as a beach town. Who predicts such things? Well, for one, this man, geologist James Falls, who forced me to climb his hill near Reno to learn about the fault. We are in the middle of the uh, what's called the Walker Lane. It's a big belt of faults in western Nevada, also eastern California. The San Andreas accommodates about 80% of the motion between the Pacific and North American plates, and about 20, maybe as much as 25% of that motion is over here on, on the Walker Lane. Falls is one of a growing number of geologists who have become obsessed by the Walker Lane Fault and what it could mean for residents of California and Nevada in the distant future. People focus so much on the San Andreas Fault and what this could mean and in 10 million years to the, the geography of the United States and California. But I mean, there is the potential that this fault could be more, even more dramatic if, if, if some of these theories are right. We know the Walker Lane is growing northward along with the San Andreas. So they're scheduled to meet somewhere off the southern Oregon coast in about maybe seven or eight million years. And what, and what does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> well, when that happens, what some of us think will occur is that the entire San Andreas then will sort of rip up through the uh, western part of uh, North America or the, or the U.S. And it'll strand California off to the west. I mean, the Pacific Ocean ends up kind of rushing through parts of Nevada, right? Well, or is that yeah, is this, not, is yeah, this controversial? It, it'll, be, <laughs> it'll be a slow process, but we may have beachfront property in Reno someday. This fault also sort of brings along some opportunities, right? We have these crustal motions in the region, and in Nevada, there's a stretching of the crust, stretching in the horizontal dimension, and that helps to kind of dilate or open up faults, and that brings hot water up closer to the surface, and then that can be tapped for geothermal energy. What's that, Jim? Did you say geothermal energy? Well then, let's have a brief musical interlude 
as we gaze upon the nearby geothermal plant of Ormont. It's got everything. Awesome fans. I mean, really awesome fans. Wells that tap into geothermal brine 10,000 feet underground. Sweet, sweet pipes and transmission lines. Turbines that you can't really see on either side of this generator. Enough juice for 22,000 homes. The Walker Lane Fault in action. Back to you, Jim. And then part of the reason there was any controversy or we didn't even know that much about this fault was, was 20 years ago. It was much harder to gather data about this kind of thing. The fault wasn't as clear uh, when, when you looked out. And so what is this device? Uh, this is a GPS station. So it's actually communicating with satellites. Its position is changing through time and those satellites are tracking those changes down to the scale of millimeters. How many are monitoring the fault? There's 400 of these sensors in this region in a uh, network called Magnet. These stations allow us to sort of focus in on maybe what, what the most important part of the region uh, might be. Like how much activity um, are people around here seeing as a result of the fault? Nevada is the third, third most seismically active state after Alaska and California. After our chat, James drove off and left me with that unique brand of existential dread that comes from learning about the perils of your surroundings and what will befall humankind. To get rid of all that, I had only one option. A night spent at the splendid Grand Sierra Resort and Casino RV Park, where, as it turns out, you can still get DoorDash and eat your sorrows away. All right, let's see what it says to find JP. Google Maps will get you close to the mailbox, but not exactly there. Expect a long gravel driveway. You got it? Yeah. From Reno, we headed south to Carson City. Well, like the outermost edge of Carson City, where an old friend is engineering a most unique existence. Today, we're a little bit outside of Carson City, Nevada, going to the house of J.B. Straubel. He's a guy I've known for a long time. He was one of the first employees at Tesla and uh, the longtime chief technology officer. I always thought of him as, as the heart and soul of Tesla because he was this guy who, even before Tesla was a real thing, he was obsessed with solar-powered cars, with taking lithium ion batteries and using them to one day reshape the automotive industry. He was kind of the dreamer behind the technology in the whole electric car revolution. A couple years ago, he decided he was gonna go out on his own and start a new company around recycling all these lithium ion batteries that he helped create. We're gonna learn a little bit more about his life and then we're gonna go see his new factory as well. What is that Model 3? Yeah, looks like it. Oh, there's another. There's one three. Tesla, two Teslas. Three in the back. Hey guys, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for letting us do all this. Yeah. You've like always constantly got some project going on at home or one or another. I mean, I, I love building things and you know, I kind of do this sort of stuff to relax. This is the current project. Yeah, this is just sort of a side fun project, but it's a you know an interesting experiment and in being able to do this you know cheaply and quickly and find ways to deploy solar without heavy equipment and it's just fun. And then even though you ran Tesla's energy division, you still want to you're building your own battery pack, right? <laughs> it's I don't know. I find more fun in the process. You yeah. know, it's you can pay someone to do something and then it's just done. And but uh, I think it's almost more the journey and the you know, the mental exercise of thinking through it. JB started coming out here as Tesla began building its massive Gigafactory battery plant. Year by year, the charms of Nevada grew on him, and he decided to stop living in hotels and take over this fine compound. Over the years, Elon Musk has gotten all of the Tesla love and adoration. Meanwhile, JB quietly did his thing in the background. Always a tinkerer and engineer at heart, he spearheaded many of Tesla's key projects before leaving the company in 2019. You come from a long line of, of tinkerers. Um, tell, me, tell me a little bit about like, your dad and, and your grandparents. And... My great-grandfather actually uh, you know, immigrated here from Germany 
and uh, started uh, an engine company in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And they, you know, he actually built and machined some of the very first internal combustion engines for boats back then, for fishing boats. I mean, it must be in the blood to some degree, because I know, I mean, you were tinkering from like what, when you were a teenager or even before that? I just enjoy it. You know, it doesn't. It was, wasn't necessarily a you know a means to an end. It was just something fun to do and um, building things, taking stuff apart. It's yeah, it's what I do for fun. Even in the early days, you know, I still remember my dad taking me on you know tours of power plants when I was you know like this tall and didn't know quite what I was looking at, but I thought it was all super cool and actually really loved chemistry in high school. That was probably my favorite subject back then. And you know, I had built a you know a whole chemistry lab in the basement and was you know trying to learn about all that on my own and understand you know, batteries and electrochemistry stuff, uh, even back then. You went to Stanford, and at Stanford you worked on, obviously this carried over, because you end up working on, on the solar racing team, and, and I mean, did you feel like there was a revolution coming, or this was just something that was interesting to you? Well, it, it, it felt early, you know, it was, you know, things hadn't taken off, and it was very, um, you know, almost contrarian a little bit, thinking about solar and solar car racing and this kind of stuff. I had an inkling that we were kind of at the beginning of, of that transition and you could clearly see the potential. Overlapping into the end of that is, is when, you know, I, I was spending much more time, you know, really digging into, you know, the earliest days of electric vehicles and starting to think more about lithium ion batteries. And the solar car racing stuff was, was really the first, you know, on-road application of anything like that. At some point there was a race and, and the team ends up crashing at your house and this is right when the lithium ion batteries are turning up and all these consumer electronic devices. I mean, tell me the story, wasn't this like the moment where you guys were like maybe we could lash all these things together? And I was actually living in Los Angeles at the time in Glendale and it was only a few miles away from where the race ended. I, I called my buddies and was like, oh, well, come on over, it's fun, you know, let's, we'll, we'll hang out and you can all crash in the living room. So we ended up, you know, staying up, you know, most of the night, you know, reminiscing about the race and talking about the technology and how it worked and, and you know, hatched this crazy project, you know, to, um, to build, you know, a long range electric car, ditch the solar panels and just see if we could drive, you know, almost a thousand miles on on electricity alone. It really, I just fell in love with it. And it, it you know, was such a fun project that just felt like it had to be done. You know, I saw no one else doing it and wanted to throw myself into it. And in those days, Southern California was kind of, you know, the mecca for, you know, the early stages of electric, electric cars and batteries. So it was a good place to be. You end up with this guy, Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarberding, they want to make an, an all electric sports car. You've got Elon down in LA. He, he's also kind of interested in this idea and happens to have a lot of money and um, and eventually these forces combine and then and then you're right there at the very beginning as well. There's some of the best times you're know, thinking back on it but it, it also you know we had no idea what we were up against you know and, and trying to imagine what it would become. Um, I mean, it was just a handful of people, you yeah. know, and you know, no one had ever tried this stuff before, and, and that was the beginning of you know how we started to understand large format batteries and how to architect the safety of, of that. And so then that was the challenge, right? I mean, was you guys were worried about obviously fires and, and then like how you cool these things and there were explosions in the, the neighborhood. And <laughs> well, it was it was a lot of trial and error. I mean, we we were fearless and we just you know plunge into this and you know knowing that somehow we'd figured this stuff out but uh, yeah I mean that we kind of built it off the experience that came out of even those earliest solar car experiments but scaled it way up yeah. and had you know the support of a growing engineering team and, and uh, you know more and more interest and focus to really you know create what became you know the Roadster. Well, this is, a, this is a really old Roadster. This was actually one of our uh, first uh, engineering prototypes. Engineering prototype five is what we called it. So a little bit before we started series production. You know, years ago, we refurbished it and uh, I sort of collected this thing and have taken care of it since. I believe it's the oldest Tesla that's on the road still. Does it give you like PTSD or, or only fond no, memories? At this only point? only fond memories. It's it's a great thing to you know get in there and remember what EVs were you know were like not that long ago, and it's yeah. incredible how fast the development has happened. These days, JB is all about batteries and what we should do with them. He left Tesla to start Redwood Materials. At its heart, it's a battery recycling company. But looked at another way, it's sort of like a lithium or nickel mine just in reverse. Sort of a 
startling amount of phones. This is, this is a big bit of phones, man. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> one of many. Redwood has a lot of batteries. I believe the technical term is a ton. Consumers send them in, so do companies. This is basically some of the incoming material that, that we get you know, from consumers. So you know, it's a whole variety of stuff, just 18650s. Scooter battery pack, even you know, power tool battery packs. It's like a, a power pack thing, you know, but this has a battery in it. So you know, it's, it's difficult to dispose of and we can recycle this for the materials. We're inventing the ways you know, that you can basically recycle this without having a human do it because yeah. it's too small. How much lithium that's been used in here would you guys be able to recover it, like, what's the reuse percentage? On Almost all like of that? it. You know, lithium, maybe more than 80%. You know, nickel, 95, 98%. Same with cobalt um, and copper. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty complete process. Redwood gets devices, takes out the batteries, and then begins breaking them down into their elemental parts. This is largely done through heat. Serious heat. Which is why these spacemen are needed. They're using an oven to create what is basically metal magma, which then goes into a tub and is stirred with a rake. Because why not? Redwood then goes through chemical and other processes to end up here. Mounds of stuff that was once pulled from the ground and can now be reused. So we got some more metal over here. Yeah, this is just a, a, a small batch of lithium carbonate that we just made this morning. And this is sort of a... Uh, a chance to see you know, what the, the final product is and what lithium actually looks like you know, once you extract it from the batteries and separate it yeah. out. So you know, this stuff is, is quite pure lithium carbonate. So this is actually the, the input precursor of how lithium gets you know, used and built back into batteries. It is pretty neat to see it separated like this and, and uh, you know, know that this came from batteries you know, that were you know, otherwise you know, garbage and otherwise wouldn't have been recovered. I mean, it's like the lithium, say it's been in my phone and you guys refine it. How many times can that happen? Can this just keep going on and on and on? <laughs> there, there's, no tip, there's no real limit to it. There's no degradation that happens to those atoms of lithium or cobalt or nickel. And it's one of the coolest things about this is that those metals are basically infinitely recyclable. Except for the small amounts that get lost in the recycling process itself, you can basically keep doing that again and again and again. So you can start to imagine a future where you're thinking, huh, like if we can do this a thousand times, you know, the need for mining new materials starts to dwindle. That's cool. After a hard day of alchemy, JB will head home and tend to his nerd garden. That might mean expanding the solar farm or fiddling with his homemade mountaintop internet repeaters. Or obviously, letting that still running, sexy yellow roadster loose. Remember kids, study hard, work hard, find a super rich friend with a Mars fetish who believes in electric cars just as much as you do. And this can all be yours too. On the next Hello World, we meet a guide who knows California's best kept secrets. If I see a dirt road, I just want to go down it and find some robots working the Central Valley's farms. You know what, I either gotta get out of this business or I'm gonna innovate. Ashley, we just watched part one of a three-part series of you taking Hello World on the road, Highway 395 on the eastern side of California. Um, tell us a little bit about what we're expecting to see over the, the course of the three episodes and, and what we just saw in this one. First of all, part of it's just pretty scenery because 395 is this amazing road that, that obviously takes you from desert and Death Valley up to giant mountain peaks and obviously lots of people in California know it, but maybe outside of California, this is not one of the, the things that jumps up, but it's some of the most beautiful spots. And then the scientists and inventors and companies, they kind of match up with the terrain. It's, it's like all these people that like to be 
basically sort of off the grid and, and doing things out, you know, where it's dusty and sandy and gritty and, and getting dirty. Uh, did you know about the Walker Lane fault before we did that? I know I had never, and okay, and this is embarrassing because I grew up in California. I had never heard of the Walker Lane fault. I'm, I, I grew up in the Bay Area, so it's like the um, Hayward fault is like a big one that I feel like we talked about a lot and because it ran near my childhood house in Fremont. Um, and I, I mean, I love the scenery of the Eastern Sierra, so I was, I was yeah. kind of moved by just seeing like how that was created by, you know, the deep geology under under the earth is pretty cool. The director, David Nicholson, who you can see in the episode, you know, he was the one who's telling me about this fault. I'm like, I haven't even heard of this, man. I mean, <laughs> how big of a deal can this be? And then I start reading about it. And I was like, oh, God, this could be like in some ways more dramatic than San Andreas. And then and then there's this whole we get into it a little bit in the episode. But if anyone wants to go read online our geologist, James, he's, he's kind of like part of a, this is a semi-controversial camp, you know, who's, who's like the, they're like the Walker Lane fault people as opposed to the San Andreas fault. And, and so I think, you know, especially the last 20 years, it seems like there's been a lot of debate about how big the fault actually is and how much it's moving. And so all this, this technology just in the last couple of years has helped them bolster their case that, that the Walker Lane fault is a big deal. But yeah, I didn't know there was like fault politics among geologists until, (laughs) until we, we really got into this. Yeah. What about, so I just thought your interview with JB was really good. Um, It sounds like probably he's been someone you've talked to for a long time. Like when did you first meet him? Well, yeah. So, I mean, JB is, you know, he's one of these guys that he's been there since the beginning of Tesla. And so, so he was kind of always in there in the news stories. And then I got to know him better when I started writing a book about some of Tesla's history and Elon and SpaceX and all that stuff. And I just thought from the first time I met him, it just struck me that this guy was really, yeah, he was sort of the passion part of, of, the lithium ion batteries and going electric and all the climate change, kind of like all the reasons you would want to make an electric car company actually meant something really deep to this guy because he'd been doing it since he was in university. And then obviously if you work for Elon Musk and any of his companies, it's like Elon that's getting all the attention. And, and I sort of think that's why it worked for JB to stay at Tesla so long is that, you know, he never really saw it attention or wanted any of the limelight. So that usually works pretty well if you're willing to stay in the shadows. But, uh, you know, now that he, so he started his own company and I just felt like, um, well, he's an interesting guy. He's humble, he's smart. And then he's sort of a guy who deserved some attention and to have some of his story told. I, I don't think a lot of people have heard this stuff before. And had, do you, I saw that his company only announced what they were doing like a couple months ago. So like, did you know he was working on something like that? And then were sort of waiting for when they were ready to talk about it or how did that come together? Yeah, it was public when he left Tesla. And even when he left Tesla, he's like, I'm going to go do something vaguely to do with battery recycling, but he wasn't real specific. And then just when we were producing this episode, he had reached out to me and he's like, we're going to finally tell everyone exactly what we're doing. And I was like, oh, great. This is perfect timing. We'll come be like the first film crew <laughs> to, to film it all. And then it ended up being like, I think like further along than I expected i mean especially when you see the big factory and that that footage it was pretty massive in person and he's always pretty humble so he, you know he sells himself okay but maybe not like some other people it was it seemed like they're doing all right and they might actually pull this off when it seems like the, the main problem is getting the cost of like it's presumably pretty expensive to recycle the lithium and, and you would just want it to make sense for a company to choose to do that rather than mining something new he talks about it in the episode a bit, but like seeing it firsthand, you could just tell that like the variety of all these batteries is such a pain. And I kept asking, it's just struck me as still like a very manual process. I, I couldn't see how you would have a robot that could, could adjust to all these different battery sizes and the way you'd strip them out. And he, I felt like he never fully answered that question really clearly. And I tried to hit him with it like three or four times. And yet I didn't see like a ton of people in the factory. And so I was trying to figure that piece out. I mean, he, <clears throat> he kept talking about how they obviously need to automate that part of the process, but it seemed that seemed like the trickiest thing to me that they'll have to figure out. Wait, how long were you on the road for the, for the whole trip? The whole trip is roughly like 10 days. Um, and yeah, full RV the whole time, which was cool. I mean, 
I always enjoy going overseas, but it's, it's great when you can go explore your backyard and, and also full confession, which is a shameful confession. I, I don't like explore California as much as I should. You know, we have all this stuff right here. And, and I'd been on like, I'd been to Death Valley and like bits and pieces of 395 Yosemite and things like that, but uh, I'd never really explored it. And so, yeah, it was a great excuse to go do that. Get yeah. out of the office, get out of the house. <laughs>